So we're going to now have the discussion, which will start off with Sheila Jeffries and Zandalio discussing, um, and is therapy useful for feminist struggle? So, um, Zan, you're going to start off. So over to you, Zan. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So I want to just uh, introduce the topic, how we came about, how it came about, and how this forum came about. Uh, recently, Joe, Sheila, and I were at an FQT webinar planning meeting, and I really don't remember what exactly we were talking about, but Sheila said something about the word empowerment, and I asked her what she meant. Then in there, I learned something new. We talked very briefly about our differences and experiences and thinking about therapy and decided it would be a good FQT topic because many other women probably don't know, as I did not know, the story behind the word and more generally about the history of therapy and feminism. So I'll hand it over to Sheila now. What we're going to do is that I'm going to talk about the history. I'm going to talk about the 1970s, really, of feminism and therapy. And I'm going to bring Zan in um, at various points to talk about what she knows about, which is what was happening around therapy in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, so I, I, I need to say that how I um, got involved in the politics of mental health and why therapy became an issue for me. Um, Back in the early 1970s, when I became involved in women's liberation, uh, femi uh, ther the therapy industry was in its infancy. I mean, nobody was in therapy. There wasn't therapy as we understand it now. There was psychiatry, there was psychoanalysis, but not really, at least in this country, therapy. So uh, I became involved in the politics of mental health at that time, because I was only just recovering from quite severe depression and I was on antidepressants at that, um, in the late 1960s, early 70s. Uh, and I'd also experienced some form of therapy with the, I suppose you could call it therapy, with the university psychiatrist, who was a woman and a quite traditional woman who analyzed my dreams and told me that I was afraid of male sexuality. So that's where I was at before I became involved in the politics of mental health. Now, I think it's very important to start with the history because probably a lot of people now, a lot of women now, don't realize that there was a time before therapy. Therapy is just accepted, like the rain that falls from the skies. You know, there is therapy, lots of women do therapy and so on. Uh, it's become so completely commonplace as a recourse for unhappy women that many may be unable to imagine a time before it. And it's important uh, to say that therapy is in fact an industry for women. Women go to therapists at twice the rate of men and 80% of therapists in the UK are women. Uh, these facts alone suggest it's a feminist issue. And we should probably also mention here that you don't need, need any training for it. Anybody in the UK can set themselves up as a therapist, which is actually, I think, a quite frightening thought. Okay, so uh, Zan, I'll go over to you. Thanks, Sheila. So um, I'm going to speak from my experience as well. My first encounter with therapy was in 1981. I was 21. I was not a feminist. I hadn't come out yet, um, nor developed a sense of community. I had a crush on a girlfriend who recommended a therapist who happened to be her friend. And he did hypnotherapy and quickly ascertained that my issues were not a crush, but about my father, his illness and his early death. He also recommended I go to a 12 step program called Adult Children of Alcoholics because he said, living with a very ill parent is like living with an alcoholic. So in the next five years or so, I found my way to Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous within the lesbian community. And I came out in what was called the sober community. Though my use of drugs and alcohol was not in hindsight, in hindsight really the problem. These regular meetings, which may have similarities to feminist consciousness raising groups, 
eventually replaced private therapy. And by far, I have to say the 12 step meetings, the sharing about your experiences, the community, the friendships, and the teachings gave me what I consider essential mental health life skills. So I'm going to go back to Sheila. She's going to continue with the 1970s. Yes. And I noticed somebody in the chat says that in the 1970s, in their women's community, they were doing various kinds of therapy. In the very early therapy, 70s, that wasn't really happening. And indeed, there wasn't really much feminism then. But in the 70s, therapy exploded. Um, there some... Uh, instead of psychiatrists, of course, uh, there was some critique of power. There was something like co-counseling. That was one of the things that came over from the States. And that was by the by the mid 70s, co-counseling was huge. So there were many, many different kinds of therapy coming over at that time. Um, but at the beginning of the, of the 70s, that wasn't so. And today, mental health is barely discussed as a feminist issue but it was central to our concerns at that time. I mean, it's astonishing now that we don't, within this movement that's happening now, politicize therapy and politicize mental health at all. Um, I joined a women and mental health group in West London in the early seventies, and it met under a flyover. Now, all of us have had issues with our mental health and we formed a very political self-help group to discuss the issue and be activists on the issue of mental health for, for feminists. None of us did therapy at that time. And indeed, at that time, we saw it as the enemy. So over to you, Zan. So I'm going to I'm going to spring into the 90s because <laughs> the 80s went by really quick for me. Um, during the 19, actually, the 90s is a, a really key point in my life. Um, during the 1990s, I lived in Germany in the lesbian community where I adopted radical lesbian feminist politics. No one talked about therapy. We lived communally in what are called, I hopefully, I think so, so Weges Wohngemeinschaften. Um, I felt liberated, literally, from the psychologically focused narratives of the 1980s U.S., it was a turning point, and since then, I've become increasingly critical of the com culture of commercializing human relationships, or human relations, better, better said. I see it as just another way that neoliberalism transforms political and social problems into those of the individual. And from living in Germany, I also came to understand, in hindsight, how innately American and individualistic I am, I was, and still am. <laughs> Sheila. Thanks, Sam. Um, so our critique of therapy in the early 1970s came from somewhere. We didn't invent it all on our own. Um, there was, at that time, a, um, an anti-psychiatry movement. And the anti-psychiatry movement developed in the 1960s and attacked the psychiatric profession and the idea of diagnoses and so on. Um, and the foundational text really for that um, was Thomas Satz's book, The Myth of Mental Illness from 1981. And he went so far as to say that mental illness was indeed a myth. Uh, so he, he argues that the concept of mental illness made no sense. Uh, and he said, of course, that the problems that people experienced were the result of a problematic society. So it was the society that created what was seen as the illness. And his book led to the whole anti-psychiatry movement. And there was trenchant criticism of the whole history of psychiatry and psychoanalysis. Can you carry on, Zan? So relating to what Sheila said, I started to take note of the ubiquity of the phrases mental health and mental health issues actually rather recently, again in the US, where I believe these ideas often originate and are quickly commodified. And this commodification that is turning something into goods or a service effectively absorbs and conceals its social and political characteristics. So, for example, I believe that a therapist could, in some cases, 
free place, good friendships, consciousness raising groups, or 12 step programs. I had never heard of this book and the author's as until just now when Sheila pointed it out. Um, but I'm, I think that um, the industry um, uh, is really has existed my entire life. So I never really at my entire adult life. So I never really had an orientation uh, or a, a knowledge of there being a before therapy, basically. Back over to you, Sheila. Thank you. Now, what Thomas Sass did was he rejected the idea of diagnosis and mental health. It was important to reject diagnosis. I mean, nobody knows about this now, um, but women at that time, as they still are now, were given a very wide range of diagnoses to explain their problems, problems created, we understood, mainly by male domination, and that's still going on. I was told by my psychiatrist at university, for instance, that I had something called depersonalization syndrome. Um, and I looked it up at the time, of course, in a psychiatry textbook, and I found out that it was particularly common in girls and young women over 18 of above average intelligence who had bad relationships with their parents. And I liked that very much. I thought, yes, yes, sounds exactly like me. But now, of course, there's loads more diagnoses and lots of women are seeking out diagnoses. And this is a great worry to me of ADHD, autism, um, uh, personality disorders and so on. So we're in a different time where there's no critique of any of this. Nobody understands that it ever really happened to a large extent. And there are many, many women seeking diagnoses. Anyway, over to you, Zan. Yeah, so it was that point of diagnoses that totally just exploded for me because what I've observed in the last 20 years, and I've lived outside of the US, I always orient, orient back to the US because things seem to be just sort of just always bubbling here on this level. So what I've observed in the last 20 years is the identification with having a condition. Um, even Illich calls it the medicalization of life in his wonderful book, The Medical Nemesis, the Expropriation of Health, published in 1975. In it, he suggests, among lots of other, uh, other interesting things, that our society is one of medicalized identities. That is, if we are diagnosed with something, we actually exist. If we're not, then we really don't have a kind of identity, a medical identity, which we all have or supposed to have. So, Sheila. I want to go back to the anti-psychiatry movement just for a moment, and it was very important. And I think notice Francis said in the chat, "What about um, red therapy or whatever?" There was lots of there was very it was very radical and very much on on the left. This whole critique of um, therapy, diagnosis, and so on at that time. It was associated with the left because it suggested that mental ill health came from the societal problems, for instance, of inequality. And the rejection of therapy included, the rejection of psychiatry included for many of us, the rejection of therapy, because we couldn't see therapy as completely separate. We saw it just as a variation of all these other forms of mental health supposed treatment. Now, feminists developed the anti-psychiatry approach. We took it from the movement from the 60s and we developed it, arguing that women were so frequently the victims of diagnosis and treatment because they were made unhappy by their oppression and then subjected to the misogyny of the male supposed science of psychiatry. And the feminist critique of the ideas and practices of psychiatry and how oppressive they were for women were first developed in Phyllis Chesler's Women and Madness in 1971. So we understood women's mental health problems to derive from their oppression, and women had many, many reasons for what was seen as mental ill health, such as unwanted sex, unwanted childbearing, being controlled socially, psychologically and financially by men, men's violence and so on. And of course, now young women are reacting against the awful problem of effeminization in which they are degraded and uh, created into inferiors and many women, young women are rejecting it. So all of those problems are creating mental ill health for women now. And it would be astonishing, of course, if women didn't womanifest considerable problems, 
we thought, because of the seriousness of this oppression and how far reaching it is. So I'll go over to you again now, Sam. So this issue of, of women's madness or this the word madness, I came to understand as a consequence of the of, of as a consequence of patriarchal oppression in the 1990s in Germany when I was working at the lesbian archive reading tons of books on women throughout history who were condemned for it. Camille Caldell comes to mind, you know, just as one example. But in my circles at that time, um, it was part of our discussions and our collective consciousness, consciousness, but at the same time, we were young and we were separatist lesbians, and we felt somewhat unencumbered by the kinds of oppression, oppression relationships with men create. And in Germany, I have to say at the time, legally protected women only spaces were with various programs and they were usually run by feminists were abundant. They were in almost every city. And these nurtured a sense of community and friendship that is really very hard to find at this time. Back to you, Sheila. Yes, and I'm gonna go back to the 70s again for a while uh, because some may be thinking, well, no, if we rejected therapy, what did we think should replace it? And I should say that in our women and mental health group, our main concern was keeping women out of mental hospitals. And we saw them as places, very, very pain, uh, harmful places of patriarchal control of women. And we didn't think therapy was the answer. We thought the answer to women's serious mental health crises, and we knew they could be very serious, was 24 hour care by other women. And of course, that is you know, very idealistic. And we were not really in a position to do that. Uh, that was really quite impractical because we all had jobs, that we all had other things to do. But these were the lines along which we were thinking, rather than abandoning women to the male psychiatric profession. And so great, in fact, was our suspicion of therapy and its effects upon women that we took up Mary Daly's way of writing therapist as the dash rapist. And I can remember indeed spray painting that on walls. So that's a very, a very serious rejection we had and a very serious hatred of therapy. And I know that Joe's gonna talk more about Mary Daly later on because we have to have her in this conversation. Now in 1976, our group, the Women and Mental Health Group, put on a conference, a Women and Mental Health Conference, which I think must have been the first of its kind in the UK. And what we wanted to talk about was how best do you support women with mental health problems without recourse to hospitals, drugs, therapy? And I wrote a paper for the conference entitled Therapy or Consciousness Raising, Reform or Revolution. I explained that therapy was counter-revolutionary because instead of creating social change, it was an individual solution directed towards enabling women to cope with their oppression and fit themselves back into it. Consciousness raising, on the other hand, was a revolutionary tool because through women getting together to examine their oppression, women could heal themselves and by, un and by understanding that their mental health problems were the common symptoms of oppression and work out what actions to take to end it. And of course, doing activism together, we understood was healing in and of itself. It enabled women to express their fury and the common woman loving joy of acting together. Activism was creative and huge fun as with community and friendship among women that it created. This we considered was the way to heal women, not to having them sit in a room on their own with a therapist, trying to help heal from what was framed as an individual problem for which they had to take individual responsibility. Uh, would you like to just join in here, Sam? Yeah, just I wanted to just end with um, absolutely um, the doing activism and for me, art and spirituality are how I stay sane um, in this really very crazy world. And having friendships, I have to say, having friendships over decades that have been nurturing in many ways, much more than my family. Sheila, 
Thank you. Now, just to explain what happened at the conference in 1976, our, you know, really um, new and extraordinary conference on women and mental health, we had a nasty shock because suddenly at the conference, a phalanx of women turned up. And as we saw it, they took over the conference. And they were the women who uh, were setting up at that exact moment, the Women's Therapy Center in London, which was the beginning of the industry of so-called feminist therapy in Britain. And that center is still going. And what they did was they used our conference, which was about feminist solutions to launch their center, which was about the creation of an industry uh, in which women would get paid to be doing therapy on each other. And from that time onwards, feminist therapy really, really, really took off. It provided employment for women who wanted to work with women. And were able, women were able to set themselves up as psychotherapists. So they didn't indeed need to register. They didn't need qualifications and so on. So by the late 70s, the intrusion of therapy as a solution to the problems of women's oppression was well established. In 1978, I was in the Leeds Rape Crisis Collective, where we were all amateurs and we aimed to help women by enabling them to see the violence they suffered as political, helping them get involved in fighting male domination with other women and so on. And we trained each other by just sitting in circles and working things through together. But what we discovered um, that the, the first UK rape crisis centre, which was the London Rape Crisis Centre, doesn't exist now, but that's another story, was set up in London in 1976. And by, 19, by the late 1970s, it had professionalized its services, which meant referral of the women victims to therapy. And we all saw therapy as the enemy. We saw this development as an abandonment of the feminist aim of supporting women by enabling them to fight back against men in favor of seeing them as the problem and fitting them back into male domination. And the feminist confrontation with male violence, of course, in the 70s came at the same time as the therapy industry was established. It's not hard to see a connection. In 1978, the American feminist um, who, who wrote the first book on um, incest and the effect of this violence of women, um, Kiss Daddy Goodnight, um, was... Um, had, was published. That book was published, had lots of accounts in it. And in 1996, she published another book called Rocking the Cradle of Sexual Politics. What happened when women said incest? In her second book, she said, when she wrote her first book in 78, she thought, because many, many women, I also was collecting the accounts of women who'd been uh, raped by their fathers at that time. Uh, we thought something would be done about it. Something would be done, something would be done. Uh, of course, nothing was done except the setting up of the therapy industry. And in her second book, Rocking the Cradle of Sexual Politics, she explains that um, women were calmed down, um, um, fitted back into the system. Nothing was done about the rapists. Nothing, 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 nothing was done about the rapists. They're all there, um, are still there, of course, but the women were dealt with and the women were treated. So she was absolutely furious and very distressed. This was 1996 to think that all of the work that we had all done had then been sort of rolled over by the therapy industry with nothing actually done about the problem. Um, so there's a great deal to say, I have to say, about therapy and the ways that it's, that it's problematic for women and for our revolution, a huge number. But the main idea that I've been trying to explain today is that rather than therapy being a wonderful boon for women and something that maybe has always existed, um, the, the horror of men's violence against women and girls, which is a fundamental determinant of women's happiness, was actually covered over and covered up by therapy at this time. There are many other aspects, but that was really the one I wanted to concentrate on today. And what I'm going to do now is go over to Joe and to Layla. In 1978, Mary Daly wrote Gynecology and she warned us 
about the Body and Mind Gynecologists of America. Now, they're more widespread, but she was talking in her book about America. She called them the physicians and the psychiatrists. So in her, the central chapter of this book, American Gynecology, Gynocide by the Holy Ghosts of Medicine, she wrote, in the 20th century, American women are lulled by the myths and rituals of gynecology and therapy, believing that doctor knows best. Daly added, I use the term gynecology broadly to refer to all those professions, including psychiatry and other psychotherapeutic fields, which specialises in the diseases and hygiene of women's bodies and minds. She argued that most members of the professions are motivated by loyalty to the profession rather than to women. Daly continued, some specialists in these fields are at times help helpful to women, but such genuine helpfulness occurs in spite of the pervasive intent and ethos of and methods of their professions. She continues, although in some cases women have no choice other than to turn to members of the gynecological professions, it's important to remember that in many instances, despite appearances, women do not have other options. B, that frequently the best option is not to go to the specialists. Finally, even if these professions are consulted out of necessity and with good short-term results, the long-term effects in often include increased physical and psychological dependency, consequent loss of autonomous creative energy needed for searching out women identified solutions. Now, these are some of the things Daly says. She said therapy is brain cleansing. It's a surrender of women's private self to the mind gynecologist, moving her to a state of therapeutic grace purified of originality. She said therapy is a direct response to the first wave of feminism and its deep boundary violation. She, on gynaecology, which she says it can be body gynaecology or mind gynaecology, and they're linked and they're two faces of the same profession and gynocide, the, the sort of the, the attack on women. She said the purpose and and intent was and is not healing in the deep sense, but violent enforcement of the sexual caste system. So I'm just going to get another quote. Um, in this chapter in Gynecology, Daly writes, I suggest that the God of therapy is therapy itself. Moreover, as in the case with all religions, there is a fixation upon the act of worship itself, which tends to function as a shelter against anomie, against meaninglessness. For this reason, any criticism of therapy threatens and terrorizes the therapeutized, which is an experience that many of us, if we are critical along these lines that we've been critical today, if we say, where we think that therapy is unhelpful for the feminist revolution. Um, often there's this um, uh, very extreme reaction um, because we could be, as Daly suggests, we could be threatening their shelter, that, that people saying I needed therapy and you're threatening me, you're, you're destroying my life, I'm going to die if I didn't, if I didn't have therapy. And that leads us on to um, the link with transgenderism. So um, if you, I really recommend everybody read this chapter, the, and I, I guess there's a PDF of it, which is the central chapter in gynecology. So um, Daly is critical of transgenderism in this 1978 book. And she refers to Janice Raymond's book, The Transsexual Empire, but she hadn't seen as much as we've seen, but she, she mentions it in her discussion of therapy and gynecology. And it's pretty clear that you can, you can make a very strong argument that transgenderism is just a modern version of gynecology. It's part of gynecology and, 
So the, the way that that argument would go is that the expansion of state funded therapy and global therapy has gone hand in hand with the expansion of transgender ideology. Girls who don't submit to the feminine sex role stereotypes or have anxiousness or mental health issues which are being marketed globally. You could look on the World Health Organization website where they say oh, everybody's more and more people have these terrible mental health issues. The answer is therapy. Now therapists, instead of girls and women fighting the class struggle against patriarchy and against their oppression. They go into closed rooms secretly talking to these therapists who channel them into the surgeon, into the, the body gynecology of the surgeon's knife. And so much of what Daly discusses happened up until 1978 is happening now, but it's self-chosen because of the ideology and women, are, uh, girls are groomed into, into this. So, um, I, so I guess it's it, girls are groomed or channeled by the mind therapists into choosing self sterilization via transgenderism. Um, so you could see it as a blunt branch of gynecology. And um, this is another quote from Daly. She says the medical establishment soon found that its colonization of women's bodies required the concomitant conquests of their minds and spirits just what's happening now. The new theology of therapy has fulfilled this role, extending its tentacles into the privacy of minds and hearts. I think if you read this chapter, you will, she could be talking about today's, exactly today's situation where you get therapy, taking women away from the struggle and channeling them straight to the surgeon's knife or to self-doubt, to self-hatred. Anyway, so that's Mary Daly's stuff. There's lots more, but it's, you know, that's a, in a nutshell, some of it. Uh, so Leila, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to you now. My experience is of actually working in the mental health services for many years. I'm now retired, but uh, in my last piece of work, I worked in what was considered to be in the UK, high secure services with very extremely marginalized, labeled, abused women and throughout my career in, in this, this, this area um, to me the mental health services uh, had very little therapy to offer uh, if we're talking about therapy as I understand from a feminist perspective as one who had done uh, consciousness raising in the late 70s and early 80s I, I knew the value of it but I think, as Greer says, the idea of women getting together and discussing their lives and their experiences is something that society doesn't want. It would prefer, as both Joe and our two other presenters have said, that girls and women enter individual rooms and see their issues as individual rather than uh, socially constructed uh, by uh, patriarchal uh, and, and psychiatry from the onset. I always found that one of the most disturbing aspects of uh, locking women away is with the need to fix them, that in some way they are the problem. But we've learned with the anti-psychiatry commentary that's been made that that was turned around in some ways to state that no, it's with people's circumstances and for women, it's their sex-based, uh, what I call oppression that in many aspects created women's rebellion against oppression, often labeled as a mental health experience and an isolated one. Somebody asked about medication and from my own experience, uh, both in terms of women in general, uh, exhibiting distress about their lives and oppression, uh, medication became a, a great thing that we would put women on uh, tablets, pills to make them quiet, to suppress their anger and their uh, feelings of violation in a society that rejected their views and their rights to autonomy and the right to speak, very much like we experience today. I mean, I do 
have great concerns about the mental well-being of young women and women in their 30s and 40s and so on when they live in a culture that says you are erased that as a woman you no longer exist so we have moved from being fixed to being erased and i think that's a massive issue that uh, isn't being addressed and is going to create more and more distress amongst women younger women and women approaching middle age because they've actually lived in a culture that tells them they don't exist in men, in in my work um with with very uh, damaged and marginalized women then uh what i had witnessed and worked against as a advocate for this particular group was challenging the medical cosh that uh, was dished out like sweets to women and then you would have incidents where uh on their notes uh that they were dopey sleepy not paying attention and so on and so so forth and that uh without any reference to the fact that the drugs that they were being given by the psychiatrists were actually responsible for women's feelings being suppressed and their views and their energies being reduced uh to silence them and to fix them as as they understood there were at that time very little talking therapy uh, and the only what was available was psychotherapy and i have witnessed and advocated on behalf of many women who would refuse to go to the psychotherapy sessions and they were punished by being locked up in their cell for 24 hours without any freedom whatsoever and that would remove choice from women at least in the general sense that women had some level of choice about the type or the therapy uh, but to actually um remove that choice for women under the guise of the mental health act uh to suppress their views about how they didn't feel that such psychotherapy was very helpful to them while i was involved in this situation um cognitive behavioral therapy was another form of uh therapy that was being offered women it was relatively new at that time but it had any of these therapies that were being used had no feminist analysis about them whatsoever and yet they were being delivered to women in 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 uh, these um incarcerated situations i mean what what cognitive behavior therapy turned out to try and do was to identify techniques that would change people's behaviors and uh some of the behaviors that were trying to be changed were women actually trying to speak about their experiences about the violence they'd experienced about the poverty about the oppression about family so in many respects women entering these services would be first of all women who had experienced uh in in the primary abuse against them in family life and then they would move into institutions and that to me and my organization was called secondary abuse because it was now the system that was abusing them trying to fix them i mean there are many more things i could say uh about <laughs> therapy um and i i'm not quite sure whether the women's therapy center in london reopened after uh it was closed in 2019 that's something i'd like to check but there are very few offers of feminist therapy and yet women together talking together about their experiences is something that needs a lot more um emphasis so that young women in schools young women would not be allowed to get together and talk about this gender ideology that's impacting their lives so severely or whether wanting to dress in a non conventional way not feminized why is that that seems to be something that needs to be altered and fixed it's all about fixing feminine it's all about fixing women and girls from its history to the present day so I think this is a good start in conversation. I'd just finally like to mention that while I was involved in this system, electroconvulsive therapy was still being used in the years 2000, which is the most shocking form of therapy that could ever be offered to anyone. 
let alone a woman. And it was majority women that were receiving these therapies. And what it did was, in fact, enable you to lose your memory, to forget what had been done to you, to forget. And although a lot of women will come out and say, oh, my depression is lifted, I feel so much more myself, whatever that meant, but within a few weeks, that would all come back, and many, many uh, women uh, will become addicted to the electric convulsive therapy. So there are many dangerous therapies, and uh, as I think uh, Sheila mentioned, the therapists out there in the wide world don't even need to be monitored. There is an F there is organisations in UK that are monitoring them, but there is no way of them checking about the ethical basis or the benefits of any of the therapies that are on offer. So I'll just leave it there and thank you. Mary Daly's analysis in gynaecology is really useful because she mm. looks at other, what she calls gynecidal practices. Um, she looks at sati, which is the burning of wives uh, if their husband dies. Um, and Chinese foot binding, where mothers bound the feet of their daughters, so mutilated their daughters' bodies, and the system that caused that. FGM, uh, female genital mutilation, she looks at that, that practice. And the European witch craze, that's what she called it, the, the European uh, assault on uh, or, or sort of women, outsider women, or medical women um uh and she she looks at all of those and then she says that the current gynocide is gynecology which is a really is a really good insight because if you we know that we could be outraged by say fgm or the or witch hunts and the killing of witches but when you see this as the current form of the gynocide you can see what is happening is that there is a uh, a systematic assault on women's bodies and a killing of women of our minds and our bodies and a, a cutting up of women's bodies. And so it's, it's just fantastic insight. And then if you see transgenderism as just the new manifestation as part of gynecology, it fits perfectly. I'll just read her a last bit from her. She says that um, what we need is... Uh, the courage to see, to find the focus of anger that can fuel and no longer block our passion and creativity. And then she says, radical feminism means that mothers do not demand self-sacrifice of daughters and that daughters do not demand this of their mothers, as do sons in patriarchy. What both demand of each other is courageous moving, which is mythic in its depths, which is spell-breaking and myth-making process. The sacrifice that is required is not mutilation by men, but the discipline needed for acting, stroke creating together on a planet, which is under the reign of terror, the reign of the fathers and sons. Um, so it's, it, it's great. She's saying what we've been talking about is that sisterhood, the consciousness raising, the working together, the action ag against our oppression and against the sort of oppression by the sex class men against us um, is the way forward and breaking out of that. And that the therapy is just a method of uh, confusing us and stopping our process, our, our lib liberation struggle. I wonder if I could just say some of the things that I've been saying in the chat about the effect of therapy on women's community because this is a very important issue and um, Lier men mentioned it as well. Before therapy developed, the, import the important thing in women's community was to be equal. So consciousness raising was about sitting around in circles. Nobody was in church. We didn't, like the left did, have sort of secretaries and treasurers and chairmen and so on and so on. Everything was to be about equality and it was to be based on friendship. Now, therapy totally trounced all of those ideas. First of all, it sets up a class of persons who, in theory, they have power over you. I mean, they know things about you, for instance, and in theory, they have some superior skills which will allow them to deal with your mind and with your happiness in the way that friendship can't. So it takes over from friendship. 
And there was a, a lot of writing at the time about the difference between friendship and therapy and what did that mean. And one of the most telling things was um, women saying things like they didn't know whether they should say hello to their therapists in the street. Now, before that, and be, remember at this time, there was a massive women's community, very, very powerful. There's nothing like that now. And maybe therapy is one of the reasons we don't have it now. But at that time, there was a very powerful women's community and you'd say hello to everybody and chat to everybody in the street in the areas of cities where women lived. But once some women were therapists, they were in a different position. They could not say hello, Susan, in the street and they wouldn't want you to say anything or make eye contact because they professionalized. Relationships between women were being professionalized for the first time in a way which destroyed all those other methods of organizing that we'd sought to create. And one of the problems that was created, of course, was that some women had chose, who were therapists, chose to have sexual relationships with the women who, who went to them, which is obviously completely ethically unsound because there's a huge difference in power, which was not acknowledged. And those therapists and the women they had relationships with would say, oh, it's all equal. We're all equal. We're women. There's no men in here because we're all women. It's all equal. But of course, that was not true. And there'd be you know, relationships going on with therapists behind their girlfriend's back. Relationships were destroyed. All kinds of problems were created in communities by this new kind of relationship, which came from men which came from men's ideas of psychiatry and psychology and so on, and were intruded into the women's community. So in many, many ways, the women's community was sort of turned upside down. And some feminists did say at the time, and some of us say now, that that was enormously harmful. I mean, now you, there isn't really a women's community at all. I mean, there's no areas of cities really where you can see everybody and worry about whether you're saying hello to them. That's just really happening now because our community has been so destroyed. But I think it's important to recognize that therapy is one of the forces, a force that came from male dominance, intruded into our community and introduced power structures into our community that weren't there before that helped that to happen. We used to have lots of discussion about what was friendship, but what the hell was friendship? There were certain things that you had to keep secret for your therapist and your therapist had to keep secret from everybody else. There's extraordinary relationships were created, which did not allow us to create the new kinds of relationships and community that we needed to do for our revolution. So I'm only saying that therapy is one of those forces, but I think it's certainly an important force in undermining and destroying the possibilities of community that we had. Well, I, I feel like, um, you know, my contribution was really from my prof uh, my my prof my personal experience having sort of been born into the generation that I was born into where you know uh I reflected back in my 30s actually that you know the or actually later maybe more like my 40s or 50s that the 1980s was all about me I mean it really Maybe it started before, um, but it, to some degree, but it seemed like it was all about, you know, me and, you know, uh, the hyper-personalization of, um, of self and this, you know, and so therapy fit into that. And um, I mean, I am of, of that generation that, and I, and I said in my, my interventions that, um, uh, I benefited uh, a little bit from the therapy in the beginning. I, it was only a couple of years on and off or whatever, but it was really about the therapy of the 12 step programs. And then what that opened up, which is about those friendships and that getting together, sitting in a room with a bunch of other women. Um, it was only women and talking about these horrific things that they would, that we would have most, some women had really horrific stories um, about, you know, about the things they had gone through. And that somehow just at that point in my life in my twenties was just, it, it, it was just incredible. You know what I mean? And I feel really quite sad um, that those kinds of things don't exist anymore for young women. I think it was critical for my 
I use the word brainwash. I said my brain needed to be washed. I needed to learn things about life that I would not have learned in a therapist's office or from my family who I was living far away from anyway. So, um, so yeah, I have, I absolutely have a, a totally sort of feel like I was in the, in the crux of it and then sort of grew out of it to be able to see it from a, uh, from a, a little bit higher up and, and feel really um, grateful for having had that um, and privileged for having had that experience. Um, and I'm not, I don't have never worked in the helping profession. So that my contribution is just from having been, you know, a participant in a participant in it. Um, so that's all I want to add. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, it's really interesting to hear how you, um, you were helped and supported by being in those groups, because what we need is we need women's groups and women's friendships to support women. So that's, um, that's really good to hear all of that subject of uh, uh, women seeking support and help for their distress uh, or depression um, on LBC London radio this week, uh, Sheila Fogarty, one of the anchor women, uh, ran a two hour session on a recent survey about women's experience of seeking help. And apparently uh, the responses were, were something like this. 33% of women that were uh, interviewed were told that they're overthinking their feelings. 33% were told that they were too emotional and that was dismissed. This is by their GPs, their first encounter. 31% said that they could were not taken seriously. Another 27% said that uh, hormones uh, were always a question that the GP asked and then moved on to 20% uh, saying that uh, were asked about their periods uh, and others accused of being too dramatic and a quarter of the women interviewed just felt invisible and I think that speaks reams about the level of uh, distress and the lack of uh, local women's groups and girls groups where women could talk through those issues that they have without uh, being dismissed and told that they're attention seeking, which is a favorite word in mental health services, written all over women's uh, notes from doctors and, and those caring for them. It's an issue I think we need to return to. I really think we do. And there's, there's so much here. It's so huge because really we've forgotten all of this so, or it's been pushed aside. And now, uh, now that in a country like Britain, you're likely not to get any help anyway from mental health services from the state. Women definitely should be talking about what to do, about all of these things, about diagnoses, about how to help each other. We need a whole new dawn on women and mental health. We really, really do. So I think it's good that we've been able to have this introductory discussion and I hope we will come back to it. The, the other thought I've had about this is that um, mothers would bind the feet of their daughters in Chinese foot binding. And what we have at the moment is not mothers binding the minds of their da daughters. It's professional mothers. And I think that in quite a lot of areas that the profession of growing our daughters up, our, our, our daughters as women, as radical feminists or revolutionaries who want to fight oppression, you know, we should be bringing up our daughters to be, to understand that we're fighting for our sex class and they should be joined into the struggle with us. But that's just been, the bringing up of children has been professionalized into letting teachers do it and letting these professional therapists who take our daughters into individual rooms secretly. And as Mary Daly says, they're more um, committed, these therapists are more committed to their male profession, to Jung and, and Freud and Big Pharma. Um, and their paycheck than they are to um, to to the well-being of our daughters. So I sort of think that that's another insight that I've got from Daly is that 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 our relationship, not just with each other, which of course we we should be doing, but with the young, um, has been taken away and 
they just believe and then they go in and believe the therapists know what they're doing which is absolutely just completely a disaster for so many girls who said like I just was watching a detransition or no a girl who had transitioned she said I was sure that I was right because my therapist told me I was right <laughs> it's like yeah <laughs> we know why the therapists are saying you should transition but she actually believed that because a professional told her that 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 meant it was true this is a disaster so yeah I would say that about believing what doctors tell you believing what the psychiatrists tell you believe all of these things are meant to show a level of superiority in thinking that women need to get fixed you know you need to fix your thinking uh, and then you'll be okay apparently which obviously from my experience and lots of women who've undergone therapy perhaps is not the case necessarily i haven't had uh, mental health services and i haven't ex experienced therapy either I asked about it once to a psychiatric friend of mine, and he said to me, "Do you want your thinking changed?" I said, "No, not really. I'm quite, I'm quite content with the way I think. Being a radical feminist," he said, "Don't go near therapy. 